It's a tremendous honor to be here, um, especially with Jim. There he is. <laughs> How could I miss the hair? <laughs> um, and, um, and I'm really looking forward to his talk later. Um, I'm sorry I missed the talks earlier, and I'm just glad to actually be here, finally. Um, and to tell you guys a little bit about what um, some of the things that my group um, has been doing over the past 10 years, in particular focusing on some new chemistry. Um, so I thought I would just start by showing you a number of different molecules that are of significant interest to the pharmaceutical and agrochemical industry. So these are just a number of kind of representative examples taken of some of the top selling pharmaceuticals and agrochemicals. And I think that as, um, I guess I just start by saying I don't think I need to convince you that CH functionalization is an important area. So, uh, but I just want to briefly introduce the talk by saying that, you know, when you look at these molecules, I think that, you know, as organic chemists, we tend to look at them as a collection of functional groups, right? And so I just um, illustrate that here with this molecule, Plavix. Is this really on? No. No? <laughs> um, so I think that when we look at molecules like this, we tend to look at them as a collection of functional groups. And if we wanted to, um, if we wanted to transform them, convert them into new structures that could potentially um, be used, for example, in SAR studies of these types of biologically active molecules, we would typically look, for example, at this molecule as a collection of the, of the functional groups that we would, as organic chemists, think would be easily manipulated. And what I hope to convince you of by the end of the talk, probably already convinced, but I hope to convince you of by the end of the talk is that um, I think that increasingly, um, in part because of work from our group and Jin's group and a number of other groups around the world, that we can look at a molecule like this not just as a collection of these blue functional groups, but really as a molecule that can be functionalized at many more positions, um, these, these carbon-hydrogen bonds, on the basis of um, the, the chemistry that's been un uh, uncovered, particularly over the past 10 years or so. Um, so I guess what I'll do today is talk about our efforts in the area of transition metal catalyzed carbon hydrogen bond functionalization. And I'll start really focusing on ligand directed reactions, reactions involving some kind of ligand that serves as a directing group to um, site selectively functionalize a, a carbon hydrogen bond in a molecule like this. And then what I'd like to do before the end of the talk is really move on to what I think is, is an increasingly important frontier in this field. And that is being able to take a molecule like this, which doesn't contain any um, really clear directing groups, and be able to develop catalysts that will selectively functionalize, for example, at, at this site right here, um, or at this site right here. And so being able to conduct pH functionalization reactions without the presence of a directing group, and be able to use the catalyst structure or the catalyst properties to control selectivity in those kinds of reactions. Um, and, of course, that's important in complex molecules. It's also important in small molecules, so things like benzene and methane. And so we'll talk a little bit about those today as well. So what I want to do is just start in this area of ligand-directed CH functionalization, which is what my group has, has done the most, the most work in. Um, and this is, again, the, a reaction that would involve a transition metal catalyst um, interacting with a molecule like this, where we have a pyridine that could act as an excellent ligand for that catalyst. And in the, in the presence of the, of the catalyst and this pyridine, the catalyst would bind to this nitrogen and hopefully direct the, direct the functionalization to occur selectively at this proximal site. Now, before 2003, which is when my group started, there had been a, a, a significant amount of effort already in this area of catalytic ligand-directed CH functionalization. In particular, a number of groups had demonstrated that you could conduct ligand-directed functionalization of sp2, or aromatic, um, and alkene carbon-hydrogen bonds, um, and form carbon-carbon bonds at those sites. And so um, what we got interested in when, when I started at Michigan in 2003 was the possibility of really moving beyond just these, these, these types of reactions, which tended to be rather limited in scope and directing group, as well as the group that was introduced through the functionalization. And what we were interested in is the possibility that we could take um, a, a variety of different substrates, um, so both sp2, which had been shown previously, as well as sp3, carbon-hydrogen bonds, that we could use diverse ligands, this donor group that is serving as that directing group for that chemistry, and most importantly, be able to install a wide variety of functional groups. So not just carbon-carbon bonds, um, but conduct alkylations, aerylations, alkenylations, as well as these carbon heteroatom bond-forming processes. So our inspiration in this area really came from, um, I would say, two important reports in the literature. The first report in the literature, and most of, both of those pointed us towards palladium as the metal to catalyze these reactions. So the first important reports were a series of stoichiometric studies. This is just an example from Bandiapathy, but there were also works by Van Coden and Sutherland and others as well, demonstrating very similar things. 
What you can see is that these reactions involve a ligand-directed CH activation, stoichiometrically, to generate a palladium cycle, a reaction that's been known since the 1960s. And this was followed by a reaction with an oxidant, typically a hypervalent iodine oxidant. And what you can see is that the reaction with this iodosyl benzene inserts an oxygen atom into this palladium carbon bond to form this now um, six-membered palladium cycle. And so you can see that this actually is effectively oxygenating this carbon-hydrogen bond, so we end up with a palladium cycle that looks like this. And you could imagine that if you added acid to release the palladium and, and liberate the phenol, you could potentially just turn this over catalytically. So I was really attracted to this example and a series of other examples that looked like this um, as a possible way of achieving these types of ligand-directed CH oxygenation in this, in this case. Um, sort of in parallel, work had been going on, um, early work by Fujiwara, Henry, Stock, and Everson, and more recently by Crabtree, had demonstrated that you could catalytically, with palladium acetate as the catalyst, convert carbon-hydrogen bonds in very simple areas like benzene into carbon-oxygen bonds in the CH acetoxylation type of reaction using a closely related oxidant. Here it's a hypervalent iodine reagent, iodobenzene diacetate. Um, and so this um, really suggested, so the, the challenge here is that you need to liberate a phenol, which can be very reactive in subsequent um, oxidation reactions that would not be necessarily CH functionalizations. So this seemed like an attractive way to protect the product and potentially be able to achieve um, catalytic turnover, at least in these simple area systems. And so when I started my career, when I, when I wrote my research proposals for jobs, I actually proposed um, the idea of sort of combining these two things and really being able to achieve a ligand-directed CH functionalization, now using these hypervalent iodine oxidants as a way of, con um, as a way of achieving catalytic turnover, and these ligand, um, these directing groups as a way of achieving reactivity and site selectivity in these CH functionalization reactions. And actually, I remember, um, Barry probably doesn't remember this, but I actually um, interviewed at Stanford um, you know, 11 years ago, and I remember presenting this proposal to him. And, and um, what he said, he said, you know, that looks like a really nice idea, but he said, um, the thing is, it's, it's so simple, and those reactions have been known for so long, if this was going to work, it would have been done already. I remember that very distinctly, Barry telling me that. And I think, you know, I think that it, it makes a lot of sense, actually, because this stuff was sitting in the literature for probably 20 years um, before this sort of renaissance in this area. But I think that that's, that's how, how fields um, work, and I think that that's part of the reason that I always tell my students, even if you think it's a, an idea that's not going to work, if it's an easy experiment to try, you should just do the experiment, because, because you never know what's going to happen. So... Um, so, so in any case, what, what we really liked about this idea is the possibility that one could imagine not just using azobenzene, which is a very simple, um, uh, you know, and, and not, you know, one could imagine not particularly useful directing group, but you could imagine using many, many other directing groups um, that are heterocyclic or contain various kinds of um, functionalities that are either present in biologically active molecules or could be readily transformed into things that are in biologically active molecules. Okay, so um, our initial reactions really focused on this, this very simple idea, ligand-directed CH acetoxylation catalyzed by palladium acetate using iodobenzene diacetate as the oxidant. What you can see here is that this reaction actually works really well. In fact, I would say that this is actually the best reaction. This is the first reaction we have developed. It's the best reaction. It works the best with the most substrates. Um, it, is, it is really beautiful, easy to conduct, and very, very, um, very dependable. Um, and so I'll just show you here a number of different substrates that can be acetoxylated. These are all sp2 carbon hydrogen bonds, aromatic carbon hydrogen bonds. Um, and you can see a variety of different directing groups highlighted in blue can be used to direct this chemistry. And all the groups where you see an acetoxy group, those started out as a carbon hydrogen bond. And so just one thing to note, which may be a little bit hard to see here, is that actually these are going through different sized palladium cycles. And so you can see five-membered palladium cycles, for example, with 2-phenylpyridine, six-membered palladium cycles, for example, with this this system here, and even pretty remote seven-membered palladium cycles with this system here, these reactions all go in, in quite good yield. So these reactions are, are quite general, um, and they can involve relatively remote CH functionalization um, directed by these relatively strongly coordinating directing groups. Um, in addition to sp2 carbon hydrogen bond functionalization, we've also been able to demonstrate sp3 carbon hydrogen bond functionalization through the same type of manifold. And you can see here just a number of the kinds of substrates that work really well. These reactions turn out to be quite selective, which is a blessing and a curse, as you'll see in a second. So, for example, if you consider a molecule like this, um, you can see that there's actually, I've just sort of highlighted over here, a number of different kinds of carbon-hydrogen bonds that could be functionalized. And what we see is extremely high selectivity for this site right here. So this site involves the formation of a five-membered palladium cycle, and it involves a primary carbon-hydrogen bond. And you can see that if we functionalized here, it would be a six-member palladium cycle. If we functionalized here, it would be a five-member palladium cycle at a secondary site. Neither of those react at all. In fact, if you have a substrate that leaves out this, this, functional, or this, um, this methyl group right here, you get no reactivity at all. So this is a, an interesting 
um, situation where we have really good selectivity. It's great in this particular system. It's not so great in other systems. And that's one of the things that I think people are really interested in, in um, sort of fixing in the field is being able to functionalize more diverse kinds of carbon hydrogen bonds than just these primary um, sp3 carbon hydrogen bonds that, that proceed through a five-member colloidal cycle. But in any case, um, this, this works quite well. And I want to note that it's really complementary to more traditional CH functionalization procedures like radical reactions or some of these um, iron or, or manganese oxo compounds. Because, of course, you have much weaker carbon-hydrogen bonds in this molecule than this one right here, and they're not, they're not getting functionalized at all. OK, so as I said at the beginning of the talk, though, we were interested in not just doing CH acetoxylation or CH oxygenation, but really being able to transform sp2 and sp3 carbon-hydrogen bonds into diverse functional groups. And so in order to think about doing that, we really needed to think about the mechanism of this reaction. So we did a lot of studies that I don't have time to talk about today that suggest that the reaction goes through a general manifold that looks like this. So you start with a palladium-2 and a, a, a substrate. And this undergoes a ligand-directed CH activation, a cycle palladation to generate a palladium cycle. Again, this is a reaction that's been known for a really long time. We propose then that this actually reacts with a hypervalent iodine reagent to undergo a two-electron oxidation to form either a monomeric palladium-4 or a dimeric palladium-3 species. And that the key bond-forming event involves this carbon-oxygen bond-forming reductive elimination from palladium-4 to release the product. So if you want to form different kinds of bonds, started to think about the possibility that we really needed to either change the oxidant or change the reaction medium so that we could basically put a different ligand on the palladium-4 that would allow us to reductively eliminate to form different kinds of bonds. And that's illustrated up here. So either an oxidant that would contribute a different ligand to the metal, or the combination of an oxidant and a solvent or an oxidant in the nucleophile that, again, would contribute a different ligand to the metal and ultimately form different kinds of bonds in the product. And so we um, and others have, have done a lot of work in this area. So we've been able to demonstrate, for example, that if you switch the oxidant from iodobenzene to acetate to these halogenating reagents, um, electrophilic halogenating reagents, you can now chlorinate, brominate, iodinate, and fluorinate um, using these reagents in a, in a, in a um, similar type of reaction manifold. We've also been able to demonstrate that by changing the solvent um, to a alcohol solvent, you can now start introducing methoxy, isopropoxy, trifluoroethoxy groups. And you can also change the oxidant when you change the solvent to something like potassium persulfate. All you really need is a strong oxidant that will oxidize palladium-2 to palladium-4, and then this nucleophilic solvent to provide the source of functionality. We've also demonstrated a variety of different CH aerylation and alkylation reactions. I'll talk a little bit more about those later, um, as well as some amination chemistry with this amino iodinate reagent. And so our work in this area is really summarized in these two uh, review articles. And I want to point out, and, and you'll certainly hear about it later, that there has been beautiful work by a wide variety of other people in this field as well. I think Jin most notably, but, but many, many other contributions by, um, by some of the people in this room. Um, so this is, a, this is a really active field, and there have been really tremendous contributions. And this is just really a summary of, of the things that we specifically have done. OK, so what I thought I would do is, is, um, is just um, give you guys a couple of snapshots of some of the things that we've been doing most recently, or some of the things that we're most excited about about this chemistry. And so one of the things that we were particularly interested in was that this manifold involving high valent palladium intermediates was really exciting to me, particularly as an organometallic chemist, because it gave us opportunities to start thinking about the possibility that these high valent palladium would be really reactive and could potentially do reductive elimination reactions that have proven challenging in the past to do at other metal centers, particularly carbon fluorine bond formation. Um, so we have done a lot of studies to, to just probe this stoichiometrically. Um, so we, for example, made complexes that looked like this and demonstrated that you can thermolytically promote carbon fluorine bond forming reductive elimination to release products like this from this palladium core under really mild conditions. And so um, along with um, Tobias Ritter, as well as the Vigilac and Gagné group studying platinum compounds, um, and, and Dean Toss has recently had a really nice paper um, studying this kind of reactivity at gold. These are some of the first examples of, of really um, achieving this type of transformation. And these high valent metal centers really make this, make this possible. So that's been a really exciting outcome of, of some of this work. And this has translated in the palladium field into catalytic reactions. And so, for example, um, in 2006, we reported this catalytic CH fluorination reaction involving these n 4 reagents as the um, oxidant and fluorine source. Um, and I should point out that Jin reported a really uh, closely related method um, that, that involves very similar types of conditions um, with, with a different set of substrates. 
Um, and then more recently, we've been able to demonstrate that you don't actually need to have the fluorine source and the oxygen in the same molecule. So we can now use a combination of a nucleophilic fluorine source, so something like silver fluoride in conjunction with a hypervalent iodine oxygen, and achieve this type of fluorination um, pretty efficiently as well. And so we're really excited about this going forward. I'll show you some chemistry that we think um, that this, this could potentially be, um, this, this concept could potentially be ap even more interesting and applicable to. Um, the idea of decoupling the fluoride source um, obviously, silver fluoride is still kind of expensive, but you could imagine ultimately one could potentially think about using something like potassium fluoride in this type of system to achieve nucleophilic fluorination um, using alternative oxidants. Okay, so another thing that we've been really interested in, this will kind of come back to the fluorination in a second, is the possibility of moving away from these hypervalent iodine oxidants. Obviously, these are not very atom economical. Um, you're introducing an acetoxy group into the product um, and then liberating about three quarters of the mass in waste. So from that perspective, you know, releasing iodobenzene in one equivalent of acetic acid and just transferring an acetoxy group is, is really not a very efficient reaction. And this is also a pretty costly reagent. And so we got really interested in the possibility of being able to substitute this hypervalent iodine reagent with something like, um, you know, most ideally, something like air or O2. Now, there have been a few examples of aerobic oxidation, CH oxidation reactions. So Vedernikov has a, has a really nice example, and then Jin also has a really nice example. But these are quite limited in scope. And then we really wanted to think about trying to generate, generate at least a, a process that was, that was um, at least in principle, quite, quite general. And the main problem with these kinds of reactions is that if you've ever made a palladium cycle, they tend to be extremely stable to air. And so if you want to use air as an oxidant, you're going to have to figure out a way to, to make it more reactive because kinetically, although thermodynamically air should be able to oxidize these based on the potential of, of O2 in acidic media versus the potential of, of, um, of iodobenzene diacetate, kinetically these reactions tend to be very slow in most palladium cycles. So we really started to think about the possibility of using a co-catalyst strategy to address the kinetic issues with aerobic oxidation. So the idea would be that we would use a co-catalyst that could get reoxidized with air or O2, but would, um, would, uh, would be kinetically reactive enough to actually oxidize a palladium cycle. And what we were able to find is that, in fact, if you use sodium nitrate, which we believe is serving as an in-situ source of NO2, um, this is actually capable of now enabling an aerobic oxidation to take place. And so if we simply conduct the oxidation of this camphor oxine ether using 5 mole percent palladium acetate, 5 mole percent of sodium nitrate in the presence of one atmosphere of, of air, so we simply reflux this in air, we can get out close to quantitative yield of this CH acid oxidation product. So I think a pretty remarkable reaction to activate these unactivated sp 3 ch bonds um, simply using air as the, as the stoichiometric oxidant. So this reaction is, is quite general. Um, it, it actually is pretty specific for sp3 carbon hydrogen bonds for reasons that we don't completely understand now, and we're working on figuring that out. Um, but this reaction is pretty general for a lot of the substrates I showed you previously with iodobenzene diacetate. Now, one of the things that you might notice is that I have shown in red the acetoxy group, indicating that I, you know, suggesting that the acetoxy group that ends up in the product is actually derived from the solvent and not from the O2. And I should note that this is really in contrast to Jin's beautiful paper where he was studying benzoic acid-directed aerobic oxidation and was able to demonstrate very clearly that the oxygen that ended up in the product is actually from the O2. So we wanted to check this. Obviously, I, you know, this, I, I haven't shown you any experiments that prove where the oxygen is coming from. But we really were hoping that it was coming from the, acid, uh, the acetic acid because if it was, then this would open up a potentially general aerobic oxidation strategy where we could simply change the solvent or the nucleophile and introduce other, other functional groups, again, just using sodium nitrate and then air as an oxidant. And indeed, when we just do this experiment, so simply adding O18 labeled O2 as opposed to um, O16, O2, what we observe is this is just a conservative um, estimate of less than 5% O18 incorporation, really indicating, um, as I suggested, that the, that the oxygenation in the product is derived primarily, at least, from the acetic acid. And so this certainly gives us hope that we should be able to use other nucleophiles and so what I'll show you at the bottom of the slide is just a preliminary result demonstrating that that is possible. So here we're still in acetic acid and we do get competing acid oxalation and that's something that we're certainly going to have to, um, to deal with eventually. But um, what, we, what you can see is that we're simply adding 10 equivalents of sodium chloride and now we can get significant quantities of the chlorinated products as well. And so what we're working on right now is identifying solvents that will be better than this, that will not do, um, promote competing reductive elimination reactions. And of course what we'd like to move on to is, for example, aerobic fluorination reactions aerobic amination reactions um, as, as well. 
Okay, so um, so I talked a little bit about air as an oxidant. Um, certainly, we're always interested in thinking about oxidants in general and thinking about what kind of oxidants can actually um, react with palladium too to generate high valent palladium intermediates in order to access these type of, of manifolds. And so, one of the things that, that I started thinking about a couple of years ago was the possibility that maybe we could access um, some really reactive and interesting oxidants under pretty mild conditions through this um, this sort of photo redox catalysis that has become really active area recently. So if you look through the literature on this, and I'm sorry, I forgot to add a reference, but certainly Corey Stevenson, Tashik Yoon, um, a, a number of other people, have been, Dave McMillan, have been working in this area and demonstrated, and, and certainly many people before them, have demonstrated that using visible light and photocatalysts, you can take relatively inert species um, and, and under very mild conditions generate highly reactive oxidants. And since our mechanistic studies have shown that in many cases the turnover limiting step in catalysis in these CH functionalization reactions is actually oxidation, we started to think about the fact that maybe generating these highly reactive oxidants would actually make the reactions go faster. We could potentially lower the temperature significantly um, and, and promote these reactions under much milder conditions. Um, and so should point out that these reactive intermediates are typically generated at room temperature in these photoredox reactions. So we have um, been able to, uh, to achieve this type of transformation. So the first things that we looked at were these reactions really inspired by a beautiful work in the radical polymerization field as well as, as, um, as photocatalytic um, shore reactions developed by Duranzier back in the 1980s, um, demonstrating that you could take precursors like this and at room temperature using photocatalysts like rubipi or um, iridium-based photocatalysts actually generate a, a phenyl radical. And what we started to think about was the possibility that this highly reactive oxidant could potentially be coupled with a ligand-directed CH functionalization in order to achieve sort of a dual catalytic cycle where the photocatalyst generates this reactive oxidant um, and the rate of this should be controlled by the loading of the catalyst. Um, and then that this palladium then promotes the CH activation and those two can then couple together to, to ultimately form the product. And it turns out that this actually works extremely well. So this is just one example using this octene derivative where you can get very high yields of these products. Um, Obviously, we've done the appropriate control reactions to confirm that when you have no light or no photocatalyst, these reactions do not go. So the mild conditions for these reactions, um, the only, these reactions only proceed under mild conditions at room temperature if you have the photocatalyst and the light in there. Um, otherwise, you need to heat these significantly in order to get uh, um, really any product at all. And so this works well for a number of different substrates. So I, I just show some of them here. So, so this, this appears to be a, a, um, a, quite a good reaction. Um, but certainly, um, for many practical applications, it, it's really not so attractive to have to generate your radicals through photocatalysis. Often you're going to need to do this in a flow system in order to scale up, which, which for many labs is not a feasible thing to be able to do. And so, inspired by a lot of the work that I assume that, that Phil talked about this morning, we started to think about the possibility that we could generate similar reactive species under, much mild, you know, under similarly mild conditions from stable starting materials that contain boron. So these sort of uh, trifluoroborate salts or um, boronic acids. And, and of course, Phil, as well as Gary Molander, and, 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 um, um, have, have beautifully exploited the, um, the, the chemistry of these trifluoroborate salts in the presence of oxidants to generate reactive radicals that can then um, couple with various things and, and promote various types of transformations. And so we were really interested in the, in the possibility that we could do something similar as well. So in this case, using something like a manganese 3 salt in order to promote this type of reaction. And so we, um, again, just combine now these, um, in this case, these are aryl trifluoroboids that we're using, manganese 3 oxidants like manganese fluoride. And then what we're able to demonstrate is now, again, at room temperature, we can um, conduct CH aerylation and um, even more notably CH alkylation reactions. So you can see that these reactions um, can introduce a variety of different alkyl groups derived from the very stable, readily available alkyl trifluoroboids, and these all proceed in, in quite high yields. Um, it turns out, and I don't have time to talk about the mechanism, it turns out that actually um, we, we sort of assumed that these were going through a similar mechanism to the Minsky reaction that, that, um, that these guys have demonstrated. Actually, some, some mechanistic experiments suggest that actually this is not a radical mechanism. And so it's sort of an interesting, uh, you know, we sort of came, you know, ended up in these conditions because we thought it was going to be a radical mechanism and would proceed similar to our photocatalysis. It turns out it's actually not a radical mechanism, but still proceeds under these very mild conditions. So I think still a really uh, potentially useful reaction, um, but through a mechanism that's a bit different than what we originally thought. All right. So, um, so I just want to finish this section of the talk by talking about a little bit about um, pyridine direct ingredients, because probably throughout my talk you've noticed that we most commonly uh, use, or, or the best, some of the best substrates for this chemistry tend to be pyridine-based direct ingredients. Um, and so I think that um, that has certainly been a criticism of this chemistry in the literature, I think legitimately so, because although there are certainly biologically active molecules and other interesting targets that contain pyridine, they are not extremely abundant. 
And, um, and so, you know, the limitation to, to these sort of phenyl pyridine motifs, or at least the, the um, most efficient chemistry occurring on these phenyl pyridine motifs, I think is a, is a, is a um, you know, is, a, is something that um, is a legitimate sort of critique. Um, now, there have been some really nice efforts in the literature to try to get around this issue. So, so for example, um, Gavorgan has demonstrated really beautiful that he, beautifully that he can use these removable tethers. So he tethers this, this pyridine um, directing group, which again is really one of the best directing groups for this chemistry, through this silicon tether. Um, he does the CH functionalization, which works really well. And then he's able to cleave this to a variety of different functional groups. And so I think that that's one interesting strategy, really useful, potentially useful strategy to approach this. Um, what we started to think about, though, was the possibility that, um, you know, there's, you know, clearly, that, you know, this type of product is, is not going to be a generally useful product, but maybe we could actually take advantage of the pyridine group that's in the, the molecules where this, this chemistry works really well, and then do something interesting with it, you know, elaborate it into something that would actually be, be much more useful. Um, and so, in particular, we got interested in these CH olefination reactions as a way to think about doing that. So what I demonstrate here is, is a reaction that we were thinking about. So for example, taking T-butyl benzene, reacting it with some electron deficient olefin to do essentially an alkyl CH heck reaction. And so I think if you look at this product, you might not think it's that, that interesting. But um, what we started to think about was the possibility that this could actually undergo a reversible intramolecular Michael reaction to generate a product like this. And now, as I'll show you in a couple slides, we think that this can actually be elaborated in some pretty interesting ways. And so to generate some products that are much more useful than, than these, than these um, sort of pyridine um, starting materials. And so it turns out this reaction actually works quite well. So I show you a number of different pyridines, and, and uh, in this case a quinoline that can be functionalized in this way. A number of different electron, um, uh, um, a number of different electron deficient olefins will react in this chemistry. And you can, so you can see a number of the different uh, pyridinium products that we get out at the end of the day. And what we think is pretty useful about this is now you can take these, this is just one example of the coupling of, of two ethyl pyridine with ethyl acrylate, so two quite simple starting materials. And in one step you can start to access, so for example through a, um, a complete reduction or a partial reduction, you can start accessing these fused ring systems, um, in some cases with quite good stereochemical control. Um, and, and we think that especially when we start decorating these molecules with more functional groups, um, this, this, this has the potential to be generating some, some quite, um, quite uh, interesting structures from, from relatively simple starting materials. You can also use DBU to open this up. I mean, it turns out that these reactions are, are, are these molecules are quite acidic at this, at this position here. And so you can do some interesting chemistry, for example, with carbonyl derivatives, where you'll actually get um, addition to the carbonyl derivative um, and then opening of this followed by a, another Michael addition to get to the tetrahydropyranes as well. So this type of starting material, um, which started out as a sort of kind of maybe boring looking pyridine directed reaction, I think is now getting into some, some at least relatively interesting looking products. Okay, so what I'd like to move on then is, is um, so I've shown you a number of different kind of recent developments in ligand directed CH functionalization. I'd like to move on now to talk about non-directed CH functionalization. So an area that, um, that has been, um, has proven more challenging, in particular challenging to control the reactivity of the catalysts, to get catalysts that are sufficiently reactive to get good turnovers and good yields. Um, and also um, challenging in controlling site selectivity in a substrate like this, so that you'd be able to develop a, a, a catalyst that would actually be able to give you selectivity in relatively complex molecules. Um, so I think a good place, well, we thought that a good place to start for this chemistry was with Crabtree's reaction. So I showed you at the beginning of the talk that Crabtree had demonstrated this exact sort of non-directed CH functionalization using simple benzene as a substrate, iodobenzene diacetate as the oxidant, palladium acetate as the catalyst um, to generate phenyl acetate as the product. Now these reactions, um, this actually is, is, is um, one of the best examples of this kind of reaction, but it still has some pretty major limitations if you wanted it to be useful. The first, as I'll show you in a second, is that the catalyst just isn't that active, and so that's something that we'd really like to be able to address. Um, when you move to substituted aromatics, you'll, as I'll show you in a few minutes, the site selectivity is quite poor. Um, and that, you know, at the time that he introduced this, there really were not opportunities for installing other functional groups. So you can do a CH acid oxalation. Um, at the time that he, he demonstrated this reaction, it was not possible to do a CH aerylation or CH amination through this type of manifold. Um, and clearly, there's a stoichiometry issue, right? So I show you here 10 equivalents of substrate. The oxidant is the limiting reagent. If you want to use this to functionalize complex molecules, this is not going to be very useful. And so um, what I'm going to try to do is at least take you through some of the ways that we're addressing each of these issues. So. The catalyst activity, selectivity, introduction of other groups, and the stoichiometry, we, we thought that these all could potentially be addressed by finding the right ligand. Right? So we're organometallic chemists. Ligands are, are great. Um, so we'd really like to be able to find a ligand that would allow us to really address all of these issues potentially simultaneously. Um, so of course, under these oxidative conditions, we're going to need ligands that are going to be stable to oxidation. 
And so we were really attracted to the possibility of pyridines as ligands to promote these reactions. And in fact, Crabtree had investigated this. We went back and did it again, and we found exactly what he found. And that was that um, this is just a reaction profile. So this is the yield of the reaction as a function of reaction time. And what you can see, first of all, is that palladium acetate by itself is not a great catalyst. You can see this is over 24 hours at room temperature, and we're only up to about 60% yield after 24 hours. So the reaction is quite slow. Um, the, the palladium acetate really doesn't work that well. There's certainly room for improvement. However, and this really reproduces what Crabtree had found originally, when we simply add two equivalents of pyridine to make this stable pyridine ligated complex, what we observe is that the reaction is dramatically inhibited. So you can see this is just a, a plot of, of product versus time in the, in the case of pyridine added. And you can see that the reaction is dramatically inhibited in the presence of two equivalents of pyridine. So this is a bit discouraging, and, and it turns out that you know, if you try 20 other ligands in this ratio, you get exactly the same result. So we started to think about the possibility that maybe the issue wasn't the ligand. Maybe the issue was the amount of ligand. Okay, so of course, and I sort of showed this on the previous slide, if you take palladium acetate and add two equivalents of ligand, you're pretty clearly going to get a coordinatively saturated compound. And this might not be expected to be that reactive with aries. However, what we started to think about was the possibility, and really based on um, some seminal work by Jin, as well as, as a number of people in the alcohol oxidation field, started to think about the possibility that maybe if we added just one equivalent of pyridine, we could access, at least in equilibrium, this type of coordinatively unsaturated monopyridine complex. And this might be a dimer, it might be a monomer, but certainly we'd expect it to be more reactive. And that if we were able to, to access this, at least in equilibrium, that potentially that would give us much higher activity in this ligating species. And that's exactly what happened. So simply reducing the stoichiometry of pyridine from two equivalents to one equivalent, you can see now this is two equivalents of pyridine per palladium, which presumably generates this bispyridine complex. One equivalent of pyridine versus palladium um, now gives this extremely highly active compound that is about tenfold, so about an order of magnitude faster than simply palladium acetate alone. So ligation is fine. In fact, it, it's really good for this reaction. But you have to add the right amount of ligand or the right type of ligand in order to make these reactions accelerated by ligands. OK, so this, um, this insight has allowed us to start thinking about really improving on this reaction for various kinds of applications. So the first thing we were interested in was moving away from iodobenzene diacetate. One of the reasons that Crabtree's work was not um, practical um, was because this hypervalent iodine oxidant is not going to be a practical oxidant if you're going to be making very low value products, so commodity chemicals like, uh, like phenylacetate. And so we were interested in the possibility, for example, of, of using potassium persulfate as the oxidant, which is at least an order of magnitude, probably two orders of magnitude cheaper than iodobenzene diacetate. Um, it turns out that the reason that this hadn't been done previously is because it doesn't work well. So if you just use palladium acetate as the catalyst with no ligand added, and that's what people had tried previously, you get less than 5% yield. So without a ligand, this reaction does not work very well at all. But what we found is if we use pyridine as a ligand, we can now get you know, increased yield, certainly not great, but now we're getting you know, at least 15 turnovers of the catalyst. Um, we started to, to think about what might impart greater reactivity in these systems. And so we started to think about maybe the possibility that if we used a pyridine ligand that bore a charge, in particular a cationic charge, that that could serve two purposes. It could potentially serve to prevent formation of the bispyridine compound because the charges would repel one another. And because potassium persulfate is not particularly soluble and is, is an anionic oxidant, we thought that, the, the, that a, um, a pyridine bearing a positive charge might also act as a phase transfer catalyst in this reaction. And so we made a number of pyridines that bore a positive charge. This is just one example that actually worked the best. And we found that this did lead to a significant enhancement in the reactivity. So now we can get about 78% um, yield in this particular reaction with about a tenfold increase in the rate relative to pyridine. And, and after some uh, mechanistic studies, we believe that this is predominantly a phase transfer effect, actually, that this is actually acting as a, as a um, phase transfer catalyst that brings the persulfate into solution and also brings it in proximity of the, of the palladium um, in order to get enhanced reactivity. Um, we've also started to think about using ligands to control site selectivity. And so I just show you here a reaction um, that, that I picked because it, it is inherently, with palladium acetate as the catalyst, inherently not very selective. So if we simply use palladium acetate as the catalyst with no ligand in this CH acid oxalation, we get very high yield, about 90% yield, but about a one-to-one -one selectivity for the two products. And so we've evaluated a number of ligands, and we're continuing to evaluate a number of ligands to try to see if we can use a ligand to, to um, improve the selectivity in this and related reactions. And so we started to think that maybe a relatively large ligand would allow us to achieve sort of sterically controlled selectivity, where we could selectively functionalize at the beta position based on the fact that that's the less hindered position. And indeed, what we observe is if we use a relatively large ligand, something like this acridine, we can now, um, and this actually turns out to be required in combination with mesotyl iododiastate, so changing the phenyl to a mesotyl, 
We can now get, you know, this still isn't great, but we can now get up to about four to one selectivity with Nocturne. Um, it turns out though that the system, um, we have better systems for this, this, this particular substrate now, but it turns out that this acridine system, although with naphthalene, you know, you're not going to be, be you know, dramatically excited by that selectivity, um, it actually works quite, quite a lot better with a number of other substrates. Um, so I just show you here a number of examples of substrates shown in, in um, where the major product is shown above. And what I show is in, um, in black, just the selectivity that you get with palladium acetate. And again, you'll remember that the reactions with palladium acetate tend to be lower yielding, they tend to be slower, and they're also giving pretty poor selectivity in all of these cases. And you can see that, for example, with this, this, um, this area here, we can now get up to about 13 to 1 selectivity. And in these cases, although the selectivity is still modest, we've actually been able to swap to the more sterically favored position um, just using this, this simple combination of reagents. And we can see even more dramatic results with some of these 1, 2, um, and mono-substituted areas. So you can see, for example, with t-butyl benzene, we can go from about 1 to 1 to 12 to 1 selectivity. Um, and with some of these guys, again, from about 2 to 1 to 24 to 1. So I think really showing the promise of ligands as a way of controlling selectivity in these kinds of systems. <laughs> okay, now, as I mentioned, we were also interested in moving beyond simply CH acid oxalation, so being able to conduct diverse CH functionalizations through this kind of manifold without the requirement for directing groups. And again, this is a similar manifold to what I showed you with the directing groups, and what we did was just change the oxidants in those cases, and they worked great. It turns out in these systems, it's actually not quite as easy. One needs to really play around with the reaction conditions to, to get these reactions to go. Um, but we have been able to do a number of things in this area as well. So for example, one of the things we were interested in doing was moving from CH acid oxalation to CH aerylation chemistry. So we moved from iodobenzene diacetate to these diaryl iodonium reagents. What you find is, again, we're just going to look at naphthalene as an example of a substrate to highlight selectivity. Um, if we use simple palladium salts, it turns out now we have to move away from acetic acid, otherwise we get competing acid oxalation, so we're doing this in nitrobenzene. Um, we, can, we can get you know, pretty moderate yields, so either using potassium tetrachloropalladate or palladium acetate, you know, less than 20% yield, these are typically around 15%. I'm at about 6 to 1 selectivity for the alpha isomer, so nothing really to write home about. However, in this case, when we use bidentate ligands, it turns out the bidentate ligands were the most effective for this in contrast to the, um, to the acid oxalation chemistry where we're using monodentate pyridine ligands. In this case, if we move to bidentate ligands and we tune the diamine in this case by putting these ortho um, 2, 6 chloro groups, we can now increase the yield to about 80% and increase the selectivity really dramatically to about 71 to 1. So, so quite good selectivity in this particular reaction. Now, um, the reason that the ligands are so different in these reactions, we've done a number of mechanistic studies, um, so different between the CH aerylation and the CH acid oxalation, is because we believe this actually proceeds through a different mechanism. We believe that the CH activation event actually happens at palladium 4 rather than happening at palladium 2. Um, and so um, th that fact, or that at least hypothesis, uh, coupled with the fact that we were never able to reverse the selectivity in these kind of systems, so we can get very high selectivity for the alpha isomer, but we can never get even modest selectivity for the beta isomer, led us to start thinking about different kinds of catalysts. And we were really inspired by this work from the old Russian literature. Again, remember I said that the CH activation in these systems is happening at, at palladium 4. So we started to look at the old Russian literature and found a number of really beautiful reports by Shulpin and Shilov demonstrating stoichiometric CH activation of aerines. And naphthalene is just one example of the aerines that they looked at at platinum 4. So you can see that in this case they're activating naphthalene, and what was particularly interesting to us is that they were getting, in this and many other cases, complete steric control of selectivity. So here, activation happening really selectively at the beta position, presumably because of the steric demands of this octahedral metal center, although it's not exactly clear why, but in any case, that, that's what they observed. So we started to think about the possibility that maybe we could move from palladium catalyst to platinum catalyst and reverse the selectivity for the alpha isomer and, and move to selectivity for the beta isomer. And so after some optimization, what we found was, in fact, this is the case. So if we simply move from potassium tetrachloropalladate to potassium tetrachloroplatinate, so just substitute in palladium for platinum, we can now completely reverse the selectivity. This yield is, is, um, is under slightly different conditions, but even under identical conditions, just substituting palladium with platinum complete, you know, reverses the selectivity from about um, 6 to 1 in one direction to about 10 to 1 in the other direction. So, so really, the platinum um, and palladium are, are dramatically different. Um, this platinum chemistry turns out to be um, pretty general. So these are just some simple molecules that we've been able to functionalize. And you can see that in these cases, um, um, steric um, factors play a really large role in the selectivity. You can also see that it doesn't appear to be just a sort of uh, electrophilic palladation. We've been able to get trifluorotoluene to work in this system. So, so um, or electrophilic platination. Trifluorotoluene and these electron-deficient areas also work quite well. Um, so, um, 
So in any case, we're currently really excited about this work and, and in particular focused on applying it to, to much more complex airing substrates um, and, and seeing what we, can, what we can get out of those reactions. Um, okay, so we also have an um, interest, well, okay, so, so um, we, you know, we're also, so you saw pr probably from Phil's talk this morning, um, there's a lot of interest in CH functionalization, not just using uh, transition metal compounds as, in tr transition metal organometallics as intermediates, but also through the sort of innate reactivity pathways that involve aryl or alkyl radicals or other kinds of radicals as intermediates. And so we were particularly, because we were interested in photocatalysis, were drawn to these um, N-acyl oxythalamids as potential precursors to um, radicals that could potentially react with, um, react with arenes like benzene or, or various heterocycles in the absence of a, a transition metal catalyst other than the photocatalyst that could generate them. So the idea here is that you could potentially generate these radicals from a really nice crystalline precursor under very mild conditions. And there's been a number of, of studies of these sorts of salts. Most recently, Larry Overman had a beautiful application of this type of photocatalytic alkyl radi radical generation um, in, in Agavanta um, earlier this, I guess, late last year. So we were interested in these kind of transformations. This is really what we wanted to do. But I think we found something that we at least thought was, was even more interesting. Because when we conducted this reaction, so again, what we're, what we're hoping to do here is, is um, release an, um, an alkyl or aryl radical through a decarboxylation um, generation of thalamin to, to form this and then aerylation of the, of the benzene. What we observe instead is that, in fact, um, uh, especially when we have R is equal to CF3 or some other electron withdrawing group, instead what we release is it, um, what we believe is a nitrogen-based radical that actually emanates the airy at room temperature. And so, again, what we believe is happening here is that the, the, um, the visible light photocatalysis, when we have this really good um, electron withdrawing group, releases trifluoroacetate um, in combination with, the, um, with, this, with this radical. Now, again, the top of the slide just shows, us, shows you the reaction that we have, um, we have discovered. I do want to point out that there have been a number of reports recently, including by Sukhbak Chang and, and Brenton DeBooth, demonstrating a similar kind of reaction in, in recently a, a paper by Hartwig that is, that is at least somewhat related. Um, what you'll notice, though, is that these reactions, they're studying with thalamid and iodobenzene diacetate as a way of generating, presumably, these same kind of um, thalamido radicals. However, these reactions require really high temperatures, um, and, um, and, of course, they require iodobenzene diacetate, which is a pretty, um, uh, you know, reactive reagent. And so we think that there's real advantages to using visible light photocatalysis to generate these types of radicals under much milder conditions. And let me just show you one example of that. This is a really preliminary result. But what we've been able to show, um, this is just Chang's uh, chemistry, again, at 140 with iodobenzene and diacetate and thalamin, generating what we believe are these, um, these radicals that do a radical aromatic substitution. And what you can see is that in this case, with, again, this, this napoline as a substrate, what he observes is a one-to-one -one ratio of the two isomers um, at 140 degrees. If we simply conduct the same reaction under our conditions now in acetonitrile at room temperature, we can get um, a single product in, in really high yield. So we only get the alpha isomer. We do not see the beta isomer, um, presumably under kinetic control. Um, and I should also point out that in this chemistry, it turns out you can actually dramatically reduce the um, ratio of the oxidant to substrate. So we can get down to 1 to 1 or, or 3 to 1 and still get quite good yields in these transformations. So these reactions um, um, look really exciting to us, and we're, we're working on, um, on you know, really elucidating the full scope and limitations of this transformation. All right, so in my remaining five minutes, I got to talk kind of fast, but, um, but I'm going to keep talking fast because I want to talk about one more thing. So, um, so in my remaining time, I want to um, just uh, move from these relatively complex substrates to a much, much simpler substrate, and that is, is methane. I mean, I just want to show you what I think are some really exciting results that we have gotten very recently um, concerning the functionalization of methane. So I'll go through this relatively um, quickly. I won't give you all the gory details. But I do want to point out that methane um, is really important. It's a major component of natural gas. Certainly in the U.S., people are very excited about the large domestic reserves of shale gas and the possibility that we can, we can really rely on that as our energy source. But of course, methane is a gas. It doesn't fit into the current fuel infrastructure, which re relies on liquids. And so I think that you know, now more than ever, there's an urgent need for methods to convert methane into liquid fuels um, as well as high-value chemicals. Okay, so the current state of the art for doing this reaction is this sequence of events right here. These are just the plants that do each of these processes, or examples of the plants that do each of these processes. So steam reforming of methane actually is the way that 50% of the world's hydrogen is generated. I didn't know that, but I uh, looked it up recently, and it turns out that that's true. So this is a really um, important process practice on a really big scale, um, but it's very energy intensive. And so you take methane, you break all of the useful carbon-hydrogen bonds in it to get to CO and H2, um, and then do a Fischer-Tropsch chemistry um, uh, process to get to the hydrocarbons and oxygenates that you might need if you want to use liquid fuels. So this is very energy intensive, very capital intensive. And so for many years now, and I think particularly 
at this in this day and age where shale gas in the states is, is very very uh, ubiquitous, um, really a method for direct methane conversion is, is is an even more urgent problem. Okay, so many of you have heard about this problem before, I'm sure, and there's been beautiful work in the area by Burkha, Bell, Periana, Newman, many others focused on methane to methanol. So this is a very a very common target, um, and there's been some really beautiful work directed at it. I think one of the best examples is this beautiful paper by Periana in 1996, um, demonstrating that this bipyrimidine platinum compound in fuming sulfuric acid at 200 degrees can convert methane quite selectively into, into methyl bisulfide. So this is, a, this is a really nice reaction, um, really beautiful demonstration of the feasibility of this chemistry, but it can't be commercialized. And, 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 um, and if you talk to Roy, the main reasons that this hasn't been commercialized are based on two limitations that I think are actually just fundamental to this type of chemistry. So the first one is that the product, which is this oxygenated product, inhibits catalysis because it binds to the catalyst, and it's really difficult to separate from the water that, um, and, the, and the fuming sulfuric acid that, that you're using as the solvent. So this is a, a pretty inherent problem, the, the, the better coordinating ability of the, of the product than the starting material, and no one has been able to address this subsequently. And the other problem, um, which is really, I think, a fundamental limitation of this approach as well, is overoxidation. So, of course, methanol or methanol derivatives, and then ultimately formaldehyde, um, and ultimately, you know, um, formic acid, all of the oxidation products, as you oxidize more and more and lose the energy density of, of, of methane, um, are going to be easier to oxidize than the starting material. And so selectivity becomes a really big problem in these processes. And so as part of a, of a collaboration with Jim Mayer's group at the University of Washington, we became interested in a different approach to this problem. So our approach was based on the idea that rather than forming carbon oxygen bonds from methane, it would be much more, um, it would be able to address some of these limitations like product inhibition, like overoxidation being a problem, if instead we form carbon-carbon bonds from methane. And so what I show you here is our, our basic idea. So we want to take methane, rather than forming carbon-oxygen bonds, we want to be able to couple two methanes together to generate ethane, and then hopefully ultimately either dehydrogenate to generate ethylene, which is an extremely valuable chemical, or, or move on to higher, um, higher hydrocarbons and oxygenates, that, or higher hydrocarbons that could potentially um, be, be value-added chemicals as well, and ultimately liquids. And so, this was really inspired by a lot of work that my group has done um, in aryl aryl oxidative coupling. So similar types of reactions where you dimerize, take two CH starting materials and dimerize, but with aryl groups rather than um, rather than methyl groups. And so in collaboration with Jim's group, we started to explore this. Uh, just to show you here the type of catalytic cycle that we believe could operate in these types of systems. And so we've done a lot of mechanistic work really demonstrating the feasibility of the steps of these types of catalytic cycles. And what we've been able to show is that if you take a metal monomethyl compound, either palladium or platinum, and you oxidize it with the same types of oxidants that we've been using in a lot of this, this um, other, um, other chemistry that I've showed you, so oxidants that don't provide a good nucleophile to reductively eliminate, what we observe is that the methyl groups scramble between the metal centers. You get two methyl groups on one metal center that then reductively eliminate, and you can actually generate ethane from a monomethyl compound. And these reactions work really well, really cleanly, really in high yield. So if we have conditions for activating methane, we could potentially generate um, ethane, and, and that's really what, we, what we've been aiming to do. So I'm just going to show you really quickly what we have done most recently. So this, this data is very, very new, um, but we were able to, um, in collaboration with the NSF Center that I'm part of, go up to the University of Ottawa. So this is a collaboration between my group, um, uh, a group uh, Jim Mayer's group at Washington, and then Roxanne Clement, who's at the University of Ottawa screening facility. We were able to screen a variety of different reactions, reaction conditions, in order to see if we could actually get these reactions to turn over. Um, what we used was Bernie Bright's really beautiful um, procedure where you basically, um, because there's a throughput issue when you're using these high pressure reactors, so using a variety of different catalysts in one well, so these are each individual reactions, but we use a variety of different catalysts in one well, assuming that they're not going to interfere with one another, and then hopefully at the end of the day um, be able to um, then extract the catalyst and sort out which one is actually catalyzing the chemistry. And so with this procedure in mind, we um, did a high throughput screen, and what I show you here are the results that we're really excited about. So we actually didn't expect to get anything, to be perfectly honest with you. We thought this was sort of a shot in the dark. What we found, though, is that out of the about 200 reactions that we screened, we actually got eight hits. And so I'll show you them here. And what was really exciting to us is not only did we get ethane out of these hits, but we also got ethylene. And so ethylene is a, is a much more valuable product than ethane, so we were, we were even more excited about that. Now, before you get too excited, I do want to point out that, um, that these two reactions that look the best are the controls. So they, they, um, they are, are um, you know, the controls. Um, so in this case, we had ethylene in here to begin with, and you can see there's a lot of ethylene in this reaction. Um, and then in this one, we actually had a conditions that we knew would generate ethane. You can see there's a lot of ethane in there. 
But what I want to point out is that um, we're, um, we, we have uh, both palladium catalysts that are promoting these reactions, as well as platinum catalysts that are promoting these reactions. So we think that both palladium and platinum can do this. Um, these ligands that I show here are di um, um, so uh, bidentate nitrogen donor ligands that we've used in our model studies. And it appears that even in this preliminary screen, they're also working in this catalysis. And we've been able to then extract these catalysts and actually identify, we're starting to identify which of the catalysts is most active for these transformations. So it's in pretty early stages, but I think a really, um, really exciting preliminary lead suggesting that this, this may be a feasible, um, well, this is a feasible type of transformation. Okay, so I just want to finish then um, by, um, hopefully, you know, today I've been able to show you, certainly, we, you know, um, you start with a molecule like this. This is Plavix, a BMS drug. Um, and, and I think that, you know, at least we're beginning to get to a point where we can start thinking about this as a collection of carbon-hydrogen bonds that could at least potentially be functionalized through these and other methods. Um, and I think, you know, we're certainly heading in that direction and really moving towards being able to use this pyridine as a directing group, but also be able to, um, be able to functionalize in the absence of directing groups as well with high selectivity. And then, you know, I just showed you at the end some of our preliminary results where we're working on a much simpler molecule, methane. But I think having some um, really exciting successes thinking about making carbon-carbon bonds from methane um, and to make um, ethane as well as ethylene. And I think, you know, uh, again, these results are really new and, and we're very excited about, about what's going to come out of them. Okay, so I just want to finish by thanking my group. So this is just my, my current group. Um, and we, had, we were going to take a group picture the other day. This is actually from last winter, but then it, it, um, it rained, and it was about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was really cold in Michigan. So, um, so we, we took a picture um, inside from last year. So anyway, most of these pe many of these people are not in this picture, but um, I want to just thank my group. Um, obviously, all the chemistry I showed you was not done by me. It was done by them. I have a phenomenal group of students at Michigan, and, and, um, and none of what I showed you would be possible without them. So I need to thank them. Um, I need to thank these agencies for funding. Um, and I want to thank you for the invitation, for the opportunity to be here, for the um, wonderful award, and, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Melvin, for, for an excellent talk. And we have time for questions. So that's a great question. Yeah. So I think that um, that whether it's concerted or SN2 depends on the on the um, group that's reductively eliminating, as well as on whether you have an sp2 or sp3 carbon. So I think in the case of the sp3 carbons, it's nearly always SN2. Um, the problem with sorting that out exactly is that you need to have a chiral metal complex, and it you know turns out to be quite difficult to make. But we're pretty confident that those are SN2 reactions, um, and I think that the um, the aryl reductive eliminations are concerted. But with an acetate, for example, we don't think it's actually the oxygen that's bound to the metal that's reductively eliminated. We think it's actually the other oxygen that's coming, in, coming around and attacking the, the carbon. So um, in the carbon fluorine reductive elimination that I showed, we are not sure. We have some other examples in that particular series where we can have a fluorine on the metal and then some other groups. So we have a number of carbon nitrogen reductive eliminations now. And those appear to be SN2. But then carbon fluorine competes. So anyway, I'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards because there's a bunch of really interesting organometallic chemistry there that we are still trying to sort out. But it's, it's, um, it's pretty cool. So, um, so anyway, it sort of depends. But I think with the SP3 systems, it's generally SN2. So yeah. Yeah. The reacting groups. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any carbon SP3 functionalization alpha to the nitrogen of the pyridine. It's because I didn't, I lost one, or it's always beta or something. Yeah, so the alpha would form a four member colitis cycle, and, and that I think tends to be too strained for those reactions to go rapidly. So, in general, I mean, we have not seen that, that type of functionalization, I think, because it would just require too small of a ring. So, yeah. The, the last part is a realization of, of measurement, which is exciting. Uh, do you see a uh, way of living for like the competitiveness of uh, all of this? Uh, this? Yeah, so I mean, so yeah, I, I skipped a lot of introductory material in, in light of, because I didn't think you guys wanted me to talk even faster. So, um, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, but so, so certainly there are heterogeneous catalysts that will do that. They typically require about, you know, but Angie Belcher at, um, at MIT has a company that she started that's gotten tons of venture capital to do this heterogeneously. They, those reactions typically require about 800 degrees. 
And they tend to be pretty unselective because most, mostly they, they're believed to involve generation of methyl radicals that then recombine in various ways. And so they're kind of unselective and, um, and, and quite high temperature reactions. Um, I think that if we can get catalysts that will do this efficiently, we could think about heterogenizing them, so supporting them or something like that. I mean, right now we're in the pretty early stages. I think just demonstrating proof of principle is, is pretty, um, pretty cool. But, but I think, yeah, I mean, no one is going to use a homogeneous catalyst to do that. I mean, I think that at the end of the day, they're going to want some kind of heterogeneous catalyst. But I think that the principles that you can get from homogeneous catalysis may then allow the design of, a, of an appropriate heterogeneous catalyst. So, yeah. Well, if uh, there are no questions, please join me in thanking Professor Sanford.